If you don't have a sermon outline, go ahead and lift your hand. Um, I want to ask you, if you would, just lift your hand, make sure that everyone has one. If you're new to us this morning, uh, we really study the Bible. Typically, we move through a book of the Bible this morning in light of where we've been over the last couple of weeks. God has really laid on my heart a passage of Scripture that many are familiar with, but some are not. But whether you're familiar with Philippians chapter 4 or whether this is all kind of new to you, I believe that this may be one of the most important theological sermons that you've ever heard. Not only important theological sermons that you've ever heard, but important practical messages that you've ever heard. If somehow you've not truly received the concept from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8, May this morning that happen in your heart. I want to say to you that God has used these verses very powerfully in my life. This is one of the pillars of my faith as a Christian, of Andrew Coleman's faith. And this is one of the pillars of really the theology and the practice upon which this church was built for the last 55 years. These verses were very, very important verses to Bill and Betty Jean Billingsley, who, who led us for many years. I was raised on these truths. So I just want to say to you that this message this morning, is this needs to become one of your mainstays. I could preach this sermon every single year, and it wouldn't be enough. Now, I've never preached this sermon before exactly in this way at all. Um, I've preached uh, this passage before in other ways, but this is a completely fresh look at a very important passage that every Christian needs to be aware of. If If you've come to faith in recent days, in recent last couple of years, and somehow no one has ever taught through Philippians 4, 4 through 8, I pray that this morning that this will be a rich and powerful experience. The title of the message is Dealing with Hurricanes and What? And Such. This is dealing with the the storms of life. This is dealing with the hardships that come. It's not just a windstorm that may be in your life. Maybe in your life it's been a relationship storm. Maybe it's been an abuse storm. Maybe it's been a financial storm. Maybe it's been a sin storm that you, that you just are really, really struggling with. There's all kinds of storms that come our way. In fact, I mean, you just look at the map um, from the National Hurricane Center this morning. Obviously, we've already been through one. And we have a couple of them that are headed our way. Now, whether or not they'll make it to us, we don't know. But it, that's, a, that's a rather characteristic picture for our lives. That there are storms that come. There are hurricanes that hit. And they can be only destructive or they can actually be used in our lives to make us into the people that God wants us to be through the grace of God coming to a new reality in our own walk with God. And uh, as I share this morning, I just want to share a little bit about um, just uh, my own experience over the last 15 days um, with my mother and father. Um, Many of you know that the storm was headed right for the Keys. My mom and dad live in Key Largo. And... um, they don't have two homes, they have one home. Many people who live in the Keys have two homes, um, but my mom and dad have one little one-bedroom house that my grandfather built um, in 1959. Uh, the house was under construction when he built it, and Hurricane either Donna or Betsy came through. If anybody remembers what that was in 59, 1960, that was Donna, thank you. So Donna came through, and it floated all of this lumber all the way up to the highway. When Granddad was, had, they, had, they had dug the footers, and they were pouring the footers, and he came back down from Miami as, after the storm was over, and he was like, oh, 
we're going up a little bit. And so he added about five feet to the height of the house. And um, as a result of that storm, and so this, this storm, this house is, is a little bit elevated, but as, you know, we, we were waiting to get back into the Keys, mom and dad were staying with us, and um, we got up at four o'clock in the morning, um, second day after the storm, and we went down and waited in Florida City, and we were the seventh, excuse me, the ninth car in line behind all the news trucks headed down. There were thousands of cars lined up on the highway by 7 a.m. when they opened the road, checking our identification, fact, verifying that we lived down there, and um, so sure enough, we were able to go. The lower part of the house was flooded, um, and so my brother and I went down and immediately tore out um, everything that was there. There was mud from Key Largo Sound that was blown into the yard and into the house um, that was there. And it was a big mess. You know, mom and dad had been very concerned about it. But for those of you who know my mom and dad, you know that they truly look to God, and they were raised on these verses. Now, when you only have one house, and you only have those things that are there, um, you know, that's still precious to you. You still are concerned about it. Um, Dad had spent three, mom and dad had spent three days getting ready for the storm. Um, They had boarded up the house. They had um, moved everything upstairs that they could. They had packed everything that was precious to them in the cars. Their their big wedding portrait um, that all of us have claimed um, and just waiting for mom and dad to die so we can get the wedding portrait um, (laughs) of them. You know, we've all got dibs on that. I don't know what we're going to do about that. We're going to have to talk to Bill about reproducing that or something. Um, but, you know, we, we all, uh, you know, th- these, these precious things that seem to be uh, priceless to us, we, we've, we've put there. Well, when we got into the house and started tearing everything out, I saw my dad become very quiet. And it was the fact that a suitcase with all of the letters and the correspondence and the photographs of my mother and father's three-year courtship had been forgotten and it was underneath the bed in the lower part of the room and it was flooded and um, we pulled the suitcase out and opened it up and there in the midst of all the salt water and the mud were just just bundles and bundles and bundles of their letters. Now, only two weeks ago, Cheryl Ann had told Dee Dee, I really want all of the letters. I want to read every single one of them. Please be careful. I would like for you to put them in order. I'd like to be able to read them. Um, And here they were. Um, Most of them dissolved in the ink um, having run. That was a hard hit. But as I was going through it, we were there under the picnic table out in the sunshine trying to get them into the light, I came across this document in that suitcase. And I don't know if you can see what it says, but it says Tifton Public Schools in 1947. Dad was born in 39, so how old does that make Dad here? About eight years old. About how, what grade would he have been in? third grade probably. Look at the back side of his report card. You can't quite see it, but um, kind of zoom in one more there. What is the one common? <laughs> the only comment on the card was, Clellan talks too much. You know, I got to tell you, there it was around noon when we're going through all this and we discovered this. When I saw that, I started laughing hysterically, and we just passed it around, and before it was all over, we were, we were just crying in laughter as we were rescuing all this stuff and laying it out and letting the sun dry it as much as it could. I want to say to you, that as we deal with the hurricanes of life, that God can bring joy and peace. Joy and peace that goes beyond the circumstances. 
Very quickly, I want to read this passage, and then I want to talk about the context of it, and then I want to give you just a few principles that I hope will go with you the rest of your life. Notice with me Philippians chapter 4 in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, what does it say? Think about, Think about these things. Now, who is this written to? This is written to one of, written by the Apostle Paul to one of his favorite churches. He, he just, this is, yes, Paul played favorites. I mean, he just, he, he loved this church that he had planted. Notice in the context of this here, the Apostle Paul planted the Philippian church. Um, one of the first people to be converted in this church was a woman. Another person that, was, that, that became a leader in the, in the life of the church, in the koinonia life of the church. Another person that was important in this church was a jailer. In fact, Paul and Silas had cast a demon out of a girl in Philippi and that created such a riot that they get thrown in jail. In the middle of the night, they are singing praises to God. There's an earthquake, and the jailer thinks that everybody has escaped, and Paul says, don't kill yourself. They share the gospel with him. The jailer comes to faith in Christ. So that is before the church is ever planted. But Paul goes on to minister to them. People start getting saved in Philippi. He comes to love this church. This church is a church of joy and fellowship. He had a very sweet relationship. It was reflected in the first chapter. He talks about how much he loves them, how much he longs to see them again. Look at number two. As he sits in a prison in Rome, awaiting execution, he writes to do what? To encourage them. That ought to shock you. This guy is on death row in Rome, and he's writing this beautiful letter of encouragement to a church that he loves. That should say much to us about Paul's faith. Look at number three. His letter has four chapters, 104 verses, in just 2,003 words, depending on what translation you look at, but at 2,003 words, and it only takes 13 minutes to read. Two years ago, the pastors read this letter at the beginning of a sermon. It takes 13 minutes to read. Yet number four, it has, it has become one of the more favorite or popular uh, books of the Bible, certainly one of the most quoted books of the Bible than any other New Testament letter. And it's all about this. Number five, he uses the word joy or a derivative of it 16 times. So here's a guy sitting in prison awaiting to be executed and he hear, excuse me, and he writes about joy to the Philippian people. Now, the second number five, otherwise known as six, um, <laughs> we had a hurricane this week. You all relax, okay? <laughs> the second number five, otherwise known as six, is he's calling them throughout the letter. He's calling them to humility. He's saying, you humble yourself as church members. Don't esteem yourself as more important than you should. Humble yourself. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, it's the only place where we really see very much about the life of Christ, and he uses it as an 
illustration when he talks about Jesus becoming a servant and becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He's talking about he humbled himself, he, he, he comes, becomes a man and then goes to the cross. That's an illustration of what we're to do. And that's what he says in Philippians 2. But he's talking about humility. He's saying, oh, Philippian people, don't forget to be humble. This is the way of God. This is a God who humbles himself to become one of us. Why should you exalt yourself if God becomes one of us and even dies on a cross for your sins? So he talks to them about humility. We need to see that message in this whole letter. But notice here, he not only talks about humility, but he also talks about unity. He talks about the importance of them being together. And so as I, as I think about that for us, I think about the fact that Sheridan Hills needs to be humble. We need to be humble as a church. We need to be humble as individuals. Not think very highly of ourselves all the time. We need to be unified together. In fact, there were two women in the church that were not getting, to get, getting along together. And, and Paul kind of calls them out in this letter. He, he names them. And he calls on the other members of the church to help these two women get along. So I mean, that's, you know, be careful if you don't get along with somebody in church. You might get your name named for 2,000 years of church history. <laughs> um, look forward to meeting those two ladies. I, 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 sounds like they were Christians. They were just having a hard time. But we don't want to be like that. There's a, there's a third thing that Paul really talks about in the letter, and it's talking about right thinking. He talks about thinking about things right. And this is so important for us because we live in a day and time when we're not challenged to think rightly. We're not challenged to really be uh, clear in what the truth is and to, to guard our minds and to channel our thoughts in the way that we should. Instead, we live in a very emotional time period in human history where the emotions of the moment tend to dictate what we believe as opposed to the truth and logic. And Paul is challenging them, as we'll see, to think rightly. Look at number six. Perhaps the key verse of the whole letter of Philippians, the whole letter, is Philippians 4.4. 4. And I would like for you to read it out loud with me um, as we end the context here. Look what it says in Philippians 4.4. 4. What does it say? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Right out there to the side, written by a man in prison. That is an important concept. The Apostle Paul had faith that went beyond his circumstances. He had a, a vision and a clarity that went beyond the moment. And so he says to us, look, rejoice, rejoice all the time, rejoice always. We're going to see how in the world can you do that. So the, the question that I have here is, do you want joy and peace? Here's how you can have it. And we find it in verses 4, 4 through 8. The first point that I want us to see from this passage is, number one, recognize that you have a choice to rejoice. You really should let that be a theme in your home and in your life. I would encourage you to go home on your computer and make a little sign that you can print out and put on your refrigerator or put on your mirror or put on your teenager's mirror that says you have a choice to rejoice. That's not, that's not a bad slogan for you to adopt. In fact, when I married Marcy, I got to know some of her Marcyisms. And one of the Marcyisms is, you know, we'd be driving down the road, she was like, yeah, I told the guy, I told the guy everything. I, I told him the whole nine feet. And I would say, no, babe, it's the whole nine yards. And she would go, oh, yeah, yards, that's what. It, and she would say, get out of my back, get out of my back. You know, she, prepositions and everything, she messes up sometimes. She's not here, I can tell this. Um, <laughs> but one of the great things that she would say over and over and over again that's made its way down into the fabric of our soul is you have a choice to rejoice. And that actually comes from our mentor, Tom and Jeannie Elif. 
um, who came and married Andrea and Nico when, when he was here. But he has always said, look, rejoicing is a choice. And Philippians 4.4 4 makes that clear. You may not feel like rejoicing. I mean, when Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown in the Philippian jail years before this was written, and they were singing hymns to God about midnight, and they were singing with joy and praying with joy, you see, they had made a choice to rejoice after having been beaten and locked in a very deep and dark Roman prison. And then the Apostle Paul, years later, would be sitting in another prison in Rome. And he had a choice to rejoice there too. I don't know what prison you find yourself in. We each find ourselves in prison from time to time. Prison of our circumstances, prisons, prism of the, of the hand that we've been dealt in life. And what we see in God's Word is that by faith and by trust in the truth that there is something greater to come and there is one who knows what is right and what is best and he sees us and we can rejoice in that. James 1, 2 says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you face various trials. You remember that. Philippians 4, 12 says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. Psalm 34 talks about the fact that, that we can be happy and rejoice in the Lord at all times. Again, we are called to be rejoicing. Now, to be clear, I've put this on here so that you understand. You don't rejoice in your pain. You don't say, oh, this hurts, how wonderful. That's not what the idea is. You don't rejoice in your pain. There are some people who really mess that up and mix that up. Even in Christianity, they mix it up. And they think that the pain is, you know, that this is the good part. Well, no. Instead, what we see here in this verse, notice what the verse says. Rejoice in your pain always. Is that what it says? What does the verse say? Rejoice in the Lord. So the second part that is here is you rejoice in God's providence. You rejoice even though you may not see the end come, the end game yet. You may not see the relief yet. You rejoice by faith that God knows what he's doing. This is faith. Now, we are not called, you can fill this in, we are not called to masochism or self-pain. Now, there are some people throughout human history that thought that the way you become holy is through ascetic practices, and that means that you, you hurt yourself, you deprive yourself, you, you live in very austere conditions, and under those austere conditions, you're, to some degree, it, there's either consciously or subconsciously this idea of paying penance um, for your sins, that you're purifying yourself through the pain, the, the idea that this is self-inflicted and I'm supposed to love the pain in order to be near to God. That is, that is not the idea that we see here. The idea is, is that though in the pain, you still look to God and you still trust in God in what he has said. Notice here as well, we are not called to masochism and self-pain. We are called to belief in God's plan. Now, you cannot believe in God's plan if you don't know anything about it. That's why you need to study the Bible. The Bible begins in Genesis and it ends in Revelation showing us God's plan. There are people who doubt God, who reject God, who condemn God, who curse God because they've never looked at his plan. The more I study the plan of God, the more my heart rejoices in his goodness. 
the more I learn about the big picture of how he was working not only in creation, but from creation to the cross to what we say consummation, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's when we finally are in heaven together and all of the first things are done away with. From creation to consummation, God has a beautiful and good plan. People who don't know the plan are far more apt to curse God and reject his plan. This is why we study doctrine. This is why we study what the Bible says and what it means and how it fits together so that you can see the big plan. Now, it's not a real complicated plan. There's many people who say, well, it's just too complicated. I don't understand it, what I read, and so on and so forth. Listen, if you will simply ask God to help you understand as you read and as we study as a church, you will begin to grow in understanding his plan. Key questions that you have that have made you say, well, is God good really all the time, or is he really powerful enough to do this, and why would he allow this, and, and so forth. When you're tempted to doubt his goodness, or you're tempted to doubt his efficacy to deal with the issues of the world, or to deal with the issues of your life, if you will pray and seek and read, God says, you will find me, and you will come and learn of my goodness. So the first thing is, you have a choice to rejoice, and you need to recognize that. There's a second thing that I want you to see here, and it's from the next verse. Notice that each one of these are looking at what the verses say. That's called expository messages, where we draw out from the Bible what it says. Look up at the top of the page in the box there, verse 5. Look what it says. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Well, what does he mean by that? Number two, I believe this. If you want joy and peace, you need to respond thoughtfully, not emotionally, to your circumstances. You need to respond. Now, that baby is not responding thoughtfully. It's responding emotionally to its circumstances at this very moment. That's okay. That's, quite honestly, thank you very much, that's what babies do. That's what immaturity does. Immaturity emotes. It emotes. It lets out all of the emotion. The baby doesn't know enough truth yet to believe it and to hold on to it yet. And so, but as adults, as, as growing young people, and as adults eventually, we, we are to come and learn the truth and learn the things that are there, and we don't have to just go with the emotion of, I don't like this, or I'm hungry, or I'm hot or I'm cold, or I'm tired, or I have a dirty diaper, or whatever it is. We, we don't have to just emote. We can begin to look and see and think and base our lives upon the truth that we've learned. Now, that's part of what the Apostle Paul, you see, God has made you and me with a mind and an intellect. And a mind and an intellect needs knowledge in order to be able to deal with it. He's given you a logical mind. And so that thinking ability that he's given you, he loves for you to come and learn of him. And then for you to learn to trust in him, not only in an emotional way, but even in an intellectual way where you say, I know what the truth is and I believe the truth. I will trust in what the truth has said. So look what he says here under number two, let your reasonableness, reasonableness be known to everyone. Now there's, you say, well, what exactly does that mean? The little Greek word there means gentle, forbearing, reasonable. It can mean, a, it, it, it's, it's somewhat diverse in its meaning. You know, we're trying to figure out exactly what Paul is saying here, but I believe ultimately what he's saying here is don't just be emotional Remember the truth and think through it logically as you go through trouble. Remember the truth. Here, okay, for those of you who are Star Trek fans, this will help you a little bit. It's be a little Vulcan, okay? You, it's okay to be somewhat Vulcan at this moment in your Christian faith. You remember Spock? Okay, there's Spock up there. He was always logical, right? He would just look at you and go, that's not logical. I mean, and you know, the, the ship would be falling apart and everything else, and he'd say, no, this is what we need to do. I mean, he, he responded not in the emotion of the moment. He responded most of the time not in all of the fear and the storyline, the character development of him. But he, he responded based upon truth and data. 
Now, that's what Christians, to some degree, are to do, to not just allow their emotions, not just allow their heart to run roughshod over everything else in their life. That's what the world does. It doesn't know the truth. But by God's truth and by His grace, and listen, by His Holy Spirit in us, the emotions can be held in check, and we don't have to live by the fear. We don't have to live by the anger. We don't have to live by the bitterness. Do you understand? Because we are trusting in the truth. Now, some of you are a little confused right now because you're not hearing that almost anywhere else in our culture. I mean, in our culture, since the 1960s, it's been, if it feels good, do it. We've gone away from saying, I think, to I feel. I mean, you just have to do what you feel in your heart is right. Watch out. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, your heart is desperately sick and wicked. And it says, who can know it? So a world that runs on the heart, a world that runs on the emotions, it doesn't understand the truth of God. What we are called to do is to know the truth. Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's not only the basic truths of the gospel, that's all the promises that God has made. And so it's okay for us to be a little bit Vulcan, a little bit Spockish when it comes to holding on to the truth. Now, fill this in. This means you are purposely patient. You are purposely, think about the word patient. When you think about the word patient, what is that? You're sitting there and you're, you kind of want to do something, but you're exercising what? Self-control. You see, that is a major fruit of the Spirit. That is a quality of God, which is self-control. So we, we patience is self-control. It's not doing what I want to do at this instant. It's being patient. It's not getting angry right away. It's it's being patient. Um, Pray for me. Sometimes I struggle with patience. I mean, some of you, everybody's got their thing. But, But look at this. This means that you are purposefully patient with yourself, with the situation, and others. Now, you see that throughout the book of Philippians. You see that throughout mature Christians' lives, that they come to say, well, I know that I'd like to lash out right now, but I'm not going to because I have the truth in me, I have the Spirit of Christ in me, I see what is right, I see what is wrong, and I need to be patient. You see, that is part of finding the joy that goes beyond the circumstance. Notice the next thing that is here. When applied to others around you, ultimately it is graciousness. Um, John MacArthur says that this, this be, be of forbearing mind, this idea of let your reasonableness be known to everyone, is he's saying be gracious. The big picture is just to be gracious towards others. That means that, yes, there's a fence here, or that means, yes, there's pressure here, but I, I'm not going to re- react to the offense. I'm not going to react to the pressure or maybe even the fear Instead, I'm going to be gracious. Now, don't turn your page over. The last statement is really important. Notice what it says. All of this is the opposite response from fear, anger. When you go through the hurricanes of life, you can have despair, resentment, bitterness. Some people respond with licentiousness. You say, what is that? Well, that's the idea of, okay, well, all of these things are gone wrong, so I'm just going to go do free license over here in this area of my life. Maybe it's sexuality, maybe it's other things, but, you know, all this stuff has happened to me, so I'm just going to go run on my impulse and be licentious. Here's the picture. Christians don't do that. Christians are called to not let fear, anger, despair, resentment, bitterness, licentiousness, or any of these other possibilities run their life. Instead, they let the truth run their life as they think um, and not feel about every aspect of our trouble. Let's flip the sheet over. Safe to do that now. Look at number three. If you want peace and joy, you want joy and peace, this is how you get it. Look at verse 5 again. 
top of the page, verse 5. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. We just studied that. Now underline that where it says, the Lord is at hand. What does that mean? The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand basically means the Lord is near. Now in what ways is he near? He's, he's near to us in two ways. He's near to us in time, which means the idea here is, I mean, the Philippian people, they're going through all these trouble, and Paul is saying, hang on, don't give up yet. Either you're going to be with the Lord soon, or he's coming back soon. Hang on, this is only for a time. So he's near time-wise. He's near chronologically. He's almost, he's almost here. In fact, notice there, actually, Life is short and eternity is soon. Sometimes we need to remember that when we're in the hurricanes of life. We need to recognize that this is not my best life now. My best life is to come. My best life is going to be when there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness. Eventually, I'm going to be with the Lord in heaven and all things are going to be set right and it's not that far away. It may be just this lifetime. <laughs> but just think about it. What is 60, 70, 80 years, 90 years, if you're fortunate, really fortunate, 100, what, what is that in comparison to eternity? It's not very far away. So why not just go ahead and trust in the Lord and be faithful and recognize that that is what faith does. It's, the Lord is near in time, but the Lord is also near in space. And what does that mean? In proximity to you. He is near to you. He is close to you. He sees you. He knows you. Psalm 46.1 says that the Lord is near. Rejoice in him and trust in him because he is near to us. In Psalm 119.151 is another beautiful picture of the fact that God is not far away from us. He is near to us. Now what this means is the Lord is present. And so the Apostle Paul, don't miss this, the Apostle Paul, in saying to us, uh, let, you know, be disciplined, don't let emotions run the show, don't just go with all that, because the Lord is near, what that is giving us is two things. It gives us both comfort, he's comforting us, that he sees us, he knows us, it's not going to be too long, but it's also accountability. It's saying, he sees you, and he is the Lord. And he knows whether or not you're acting like he wants you to act and trusting like he wants you to trust. And so it's saying that, you know, for those who trust in the Lord, they are rewarded. And, and he's calling you and me both with comfort and accountability that he is, he is near to us. Um, you know, I don't think I ever said number three is this. Number three up there, remember that God is close enough to see and hear your situation and your response. So he's, he's seeing all about the situation you're in, and he knows how you're going to respond, or he's going to watch also how you're going to respond, and this is an opportunity for us to trust in him. Number, six, or number four comes from verse six. Can you read number, verse six with me? It's in the box on the page that is there. Let's read it. It starts with do not, all right? Look, read verse six with me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And number four comes from verse six, and it's the first thing is, reject anxiety. If you want peace and joy in your life, you must learn to reject anxiety. You see, anxiety is a result of fear and worry. Anxiety is a result of fear and worry. By God's grace, he can come and work in your life. And listen, as you learn more and more and more of this book, if you will allow this book and the truths of this book, even the truths of Philippians, this little letter, if you were to begin to memorize those verses, if you were to begin to quote them when you get up in the morning, when you go for a walk, when you're driving to work, when you're coming home to do what it is that you're doing on your life, if you will begin to feed your mind and your heart on the truth of God, just say even in Philippians, all of the beautiful promises in Philippians, 
you will begin to see how anxiety can be rejected. Now, I know that there's different medical conditions, and we live in a day and time when there's, there's um, a lot of medicine that helps people deal with anxiety. But I want to say to you that your first line of defense needs to be the truth and faith in the truth, not a little pill. Now, I'm not, not coming down on Prozac, I'm not coming down on people who, who take something along those lines to help with the pressures of life and all of that kind of thing. Sometimes that's very appropriate, and there's some people who really need that, and there's no problem with that. But friends, don't take Prozac and don't take all of the anti-anxiety things without looking to God's Word. That's what Christians do. Do you hear me? Not condemning that. Not condemning that. I'm just simply saying there's so much more that's at your disposal that so often is overlooked, so often because we've not taken the time, so often because we've not been disciplined to know what God's Word says. So just get your Bible, get a notebook, get a pen, start reading, start looking, start memorizing, start praying through those passages, and you may be astounded to find the peace and the joy that God can bring amidst really hard and pressure-filled times. Um, so be careful to depend upon the right things. Now, here, here's, here's part of the picture. The rationale on this, because he says it, be anxious for nothing. Uh, he's not exaggerating here. He really is saying that. Here's the rationale. If you have been con- covered by God's grace and you have his promise of forgiveness in eternal life with him, you ultimately do not have a reason to be afraid. In fact, The Apostle Paul would say, to live is Christ, and to die is what? Is gain. He's saying, if I live through these storms, if I live through these troubles and these hardships, may I do it for Christ. And if I die, it's all the better. I want you to see a couple of verses here that are so beautiful. Instead of being gripped by fear, grab on to grace. Fill that in. Instead of being gripped by fear, grab onto grace. When the hurricanes come, hold on to the truths that we know in the big picture. 2 Timothy 1 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Of power and love and a sound mind. I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but I, I called up my dad when I was a, a freshman in college at Florida State, and I told him, I said, Dad, I think I'm losing my mind. He said, yeah, I know how you feel. I've felt that way too. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, stresses of life, stresses of Sheridan Hills, stresses of all these things. Sometimes it's, you know, it's a lot. Life is hard. But he said, you know, I have to go back to the fact that God brings sanity to my mind and my heart. And he directed me to this passage of Scripture. For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind. You memorize that. Put that on the walls of your house. Quote it, live it, pray it. And the storms of life can become actually filled with joy and peace. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 4 through 7. Jesus is speaking, and notice what it says there on this passage. I will tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after they have... and after." that have nothing more that they can do. Don't fear people who can kill you. Look at verse 5. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he is killed has the authority to cast it into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Jesus is saying this. Look at verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? He's saying they're worthless, and yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Wow. Wow. Why even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. Underline that. Circle it. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. Friends, I just want to say to you, God has a reason for us to not live in fear and get gripped by fear. 
Look at Romans 8, 15. I love this. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, look what it says, Abba, Father, right below that, Daddy. That's what it means. The picture is this intimate nearness to God. This isn't a faraway God. This is a God who's near. He's at hand for you. He's at hand with you. He sees you. He hears you. He knows what's going on. And he wants you and me to live by faith through the hurricanes of life and through the long hardships of life because it's only a little while and then we will be with him. Notice this at the bottom of number four is rejecting fear involves faith and discipline. Rejecting fear involves faith. You, you, you got to look, look at the truth and put your, say, I believe that. I'm going to trust in what God has said. And then I'm going to be disciplined to believe that. That means you may need to memorize Scripture. That means you may need to sit there and, and quote the Scriptures on your way to work. You say, you know, these coworkers that I have are really hard. This job I have is really hard. I, this, is, this is one of the hardest things. I'm, some of you, your, your hardest thing is your job. And you're getting along with the people there. For some of you, it's not your job, but it's when you come home. The people you live with, it's one of the hardest things in your life. Listen, we, we, by faith and trust, we see what God's word says and we trust in him with even the most difficult things. You see, in part, it's a mind over matter issue. God has made you an, a thinking person and he's given you an intellect and he wants you to know the truth and to trust and to believe in the truth. Well, how do we do all of this? We do this through prayer. And notice number five, replace fear and anxiety with prayer. Um, and look with me in verse seven, and I'm going to ask you if you would to read verse seven with me as well. Everybody read verse seven. If you, so if you do number six, if you do verse six, which is don't be anxious, but in everything, um, you know what? I, I almost said verse eight. We need to all read verse six, not verse seven. Uh, read verse six with me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay, so in the middle part of verse 7, that is what you do. That's how you do it. That's how you get to where you need to go in your faith. You live in, in prayer. And this is, the part, this is communing with God. This is talking with God constantly. There's three modes of prayer that are mentioned here. Letter A, it's constant, unceasing prayer. It's about everything. It's not just praying about when things, the trouble comes. You know, there's a lot of people that the only time they pray is when the pressure hits. I mean, then you go clear a spot on the bedroom floor and get down before the Lord and cry out. Well, why not clear a spot on the bedroom floor, get down, and rejoice when times are good? And pray about the daily things in life. You see, it's being disciplined and being filled with faith to stay with God, to walk with God on a daily basis. This is what he wants with us, is that we would walk in faith. So it's constant, unceasing prayer. And then when the hurricane hits, you're ready. Um, notice this, letter B, it's asking. That's what the word supplication means. It's specific requests. You ask for the things that you need. You ask for the things that are at hand. And when you, as you do that, you learn to look to him and to trust in him. I mean, Jesus, when the, apostle, when the apostles came to him and said, teach us to pray, what did he say? He said, Pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What? Give us this day our daily bread. He, I mean, that, a basic thing. He, he invites us to ask for the things in our life that we need. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You see, when, when asked how to pray, Jesus said, ask God for the things that you need. Let her see. All the while, give thanks. You see, we shouldn't just be in a constant asking without a constant thanking. So an attitude of gratitude 
gains altitude. If your out, if your attitude is very low and you want your attitude to get high, get higher than it is, I encourage you that an attitude of gratitude will bring your attitude up. Uh, this is where joy, this is where thankfulness, this is where peace comes from. Now, don't tune out yet because the best is right here. Verse 7 is the big promise that if you will reject anxiety and if you will learn to f have faith in the things that God has said and if you will pray, if you will pray constantly, verse 7 is the huge blowout promise. All right, here you go. Look at verse 7. Let's all read it out loud. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is massive. It's peace that goes, but you're, you, it's the type, you know, I don't understand it, I have total peace. We had a person in our church that was falsely accused, truly falsely accused of something, and just as a result of just craziness, wound up in the jail in Broward County. A woman, a professional woman in our church. And she got there and she said, you know, I didn't know what to do exactly, but as I sat in the cell, in the jail, all alone, and at night, my husband couldn't be there, nobody, I couldn't talk to anybody, I've been arrested, falsely accused, and here I am. She said, I just started singing. The Apostle Paul started singing. I started singing. And she said, I sang every hymn and every song that I could think of, made up words when I didn't know the words. And she said, I just trusted that they thought I was crazy. She was completely cleared of all of that foolishness. But her, the great test was, what are you going to do with this? What if you got falsely accused? Or what if you got rightly accused? And you wind up in a circumstance like that. Oh, that we would come in faith to God. That we would reject the anxiety and the fear. And we would place our, our faith and our trust in what we know of Him. Then look at the promise. The peace that you can't even explain. And that's exactly what she said. Peace washed over me. I was no longer afraid. Edward has said, amidst his fight with cancer, that the anxiety would come up and the fear would come and what is going to happen? What is going to happen to me? What is going to happen to Jessica? And he said, and then, like a washing river would flood over me would be God's peace. Have you experienced that amidst the troubles of life? That's what God's kids get to get. If you've never experienced that, listen, friend, it may be because Jesus has not just come and become the Lord of your life, and you need to give your life to Christ. Maybe you've never transferred trust from self to him. That's where it all begins. Christ came and died for our sins so that we do not have to bear them any longer and so that we do not have to go through the pressures and the struggles and the hurricanes of life by ourselves but a loving Father who invites us to say, Abba, Father, who invites us to call him Daddy, says, if you will come and you will learn to pray, and if you will learn to rest in me and listen to me, and if you will wait upon me, I will give you a peace that you don't understand. This is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He's going to demand, if you're his children, that you have faith. And he's going to test your faith. He did it with Job. Job, was a right, Job didn't go through all of that because of his sin. Job went through all of that because he was faithful. So sometimes when you see someone going through difficult times, it's not that we go, oh man, I wonder what, what they're paying for. That's not the way God works. Jesus took it all at the cross, and for his children, sometimes we suffer just so we can grow and know him more. You say, well, I don't like a God like that. Well, you may not be one of his. 
The big picture of the Bible shows us that this is the way God works. And he is good and he's righteous. And he knows, and it's all going to be worth it in the end. See, that, look at number six. It's a joy, in, it's, a, it's a God's incomprehensible peace that takes over. This is the peace amidst the storm. It is this peace that holds us fast in Christ. Look at verse 7. Look what it says at the end of verse 7. He will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, he keeps his own. And then look at the last one. He gives a joy that is inexpressible. In 1 Peter 1, 8, he gives a joy that's inexpressible. 1 Peter 1, 8, I want you to see this and just notice what the screen says. Though you have not seen him, you love him. You see, that's faith. We don't walk by faith, by, by sight, we walk by faith. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him. That's faith. And you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Only the Holy Spirit can do that in you. And he will do that. He promises to do that. Now I want to show you something as we close. In the hurricanes of life, storms of life, when disappointments come, when all the love, love, love letters, you know, it's funny, Dad said this amidst the storm. He said, you know, Andrew, he said it's amazing, three days getting ready for the storm, boarding up, moving stuff, taking care of this, taking care of that, all I had to do was reach under the bed and pull out the suitcase with all of the letters and set it on top of the filing cabinet and it would have been fine. It would have been dry as a bone. He said three seconds was all that was needed to save something. That, he said, I saved things. I spent hours saving things that were five bucks and 50 cents and everything else. But the thing that was priceless, I missed. Now, sometimes that's going to happen. Sometimes the storms of life are going to hit like that that you just don't understand, you know, why didn't I see that? Why didn't I take it? Why didn't I see that car coming? I pull, you know, whatever it is. But that's the way it is. The priceless things sometimes are like that, you know, to us. After he pulled out the suitcase and discovered that, he pulled out another case, and he found his trumpet from high school at Miami High. Dad was the first trumpet in the band with Ed Vorher, who was a acclaimed high school band director. And he hadn't played, you know, Dad hasn't played the trumpet in 40 years. But he pulled it out from underneath the bed. And in the midst of everything, and toward the end of the day, as Mark and I were about to leave, I want you to see this. Rinse it out. <laughs> together listen everybody the storms hit and Christ did you see the seawater pouring out the front of the, the the trumpet the storms of life are gonna hit and what you have trained yourself to do in the good times what you have disciplined yourself to do in the good times what you have built in your spiritual muscles and in the truth of this, God, of this word will see you through losing some of the most precious things in this life. But if you don't give attention to this word, if you don't grow in fellowship with the brothers and sisters in Christ, if you don't have a strong faith, the storms of life are going to just knock you over. I want to encourage you to be a true Christian, be a strong Christian. You know what? Because, look at the next slide, oh, there's other storms that are coming. And there's some more behind that one. I mean, you know, that's the way it's always going to be. They might turn north and miss you, but they might not. 
May we trust in the Lord as we are dealing with the hurricanes.